Okay, everybody, um, this is the polynomials review um, for our for honors uh, pre calc. You did all of this um, last year in Algebra 2 Honors. Um, I need for you to be able to use those skills. Um, so I need for you to read through this first page on the basic definitions. Um, and then we're, I'm going to start down here with solving polynomial equations um, to give you just a couple quick um, review questions. Uh, then if you've got questions, by all means, you can come to office hours and ask. This is just meant to sort of get your brains thinking about what you've done in the past. So if you want to pause me, um, go ahead and read through the everything down to this first page down here to problem number one, and then we'll start back up again. Okay, so we're going to start solving polynomial equations. You know that they're a polynomial equation because all of the powers are um, whole numbers. Um, there's no fractions as far as x is in the denominator. Of course, you could have one half as a coefficient, that type of thing but no um, x values or x's to, to define as the polynomial function, all of the um, exponents would have to be whole numbers. So no negatives, no radicals, no square roots of x, no cube roots of x, nothing like that, because of course that would be x to the one half and x to the one third, and these have to be all whole number um, exponents. So the first thing that we're gonna do to solve this problem is we're going to bring the four over to the other side so that we can then factor it. Of course, if it doesn't factor, we have the choices of it factoring. That would be our first choice. Second, we could um, square root, especially, you know, or cube root or something if we could. Um, we could also complete the square if it's a square. So these are ways that we would solve a, a quadratic. Um, here, this is a quartic equation. I only have one choice. I can factor it. Um, and then last but not least, your quadratic formula. So if you're going to run your quadratic formula, I assume that you know it. I tend not to run it very often. So here I'm going to factor. So we want to get factors of x to the fourth. That, that would give us an x squared in the middle. And then factors of four that give me three. And it looks like here that I'm going to be able to factor this again. Oops, that should be a minus. And of course, this is not difference of squares, so it does not factor again. Since this is a fourth degree, the fundamental theorem of algebra says that I'm looking for four solutions. So one of my solutions here is negative two, because that would be using my zero product property. If I said each of these factors equal to zero, so technically I'm saying, okay, if x plus two is zero, what would give me that solution? x minus 2 is equal to 0, what would give me that solution? And I'd be fine if you wrote plus and minus 2. And then here we're down to a quadratic. If I set that equal to 0, well, that gives me all of these choices because I now have a degree 2 where I can go back to ways that we solve a quadratic. So I think I'm going to take the square root method, and when I take the square root, I'm going to get plus and minus i because we all know that the square roots of negative 1 is i. So technically I have plus and minus the square root of two and plus and minus, or plus and minus two, sorry, and plus and minus i. Okay, so we're gonna work through on how to solve those equations. And one of the ways that we're gonna use, if we can't factor it, is to then be able to do some sort of a division. So we need to make sure that you remember long and synthetic division from the past. So both of these problems could be done using synthetic division. Synthetic division can only be done if you're dividing by a first degree binomial. So technically, the problem that we are doing here, we could have also done um, with synthetic division, but we're going to choose to do long division. Um, long division works on everything, um, except uh, it does work on everything. There's no exception there. Um, the problem is that long division is a very long process, and we need to be very careful with our signs as we run through this. So as I start long division, I would say x goes into x squared how many times? Well, that would be x. And then I'm going to take x times this binomial, so x squared plus 1x. You're going to see me every single time I write long division, that I'm going to come through with a different color and subtract. So that should go away every single time. And this is now no longer a plus, I made it a subtraction, 
so I have 2x plus 5. And then I go again. x times what would give me that first term? Well, that would be a 2. I'm going to take that 2 times that binomial and get 2x plus 2. Then I come through and subtract everything, and that first term goes away, and it looks like I'm left with 3. So for me to write my remainder of 3, my answer would be x plus 2 plus 3 over x plus 1, because I'm going to put my remainder over my divisor. Now, of course, I really want from Algebra 2, we want things here to um, divide evenly. We like it when the remainder is 0. It doesn't always happen, but it happens. Okay, so number 4, for me to run synthetic division, we put that x minus 3 out here, and then I want to fill in all of the values that I have. So I write x to the 4th, no x cubes, some x squareds, negative 10 of them, two x's, and a 3. Now, some of you just may fill in those coefficients, the 1, the 0, the negative 10, the 2, and the 3, and that is fine. I'm, I mean, that's what most people do. I tend to write it all out. And the number that I'm actually going to run synthetic division on or with is that 3. So this first number drops down. Oops, sorry, that should be a 1. And then I do 3 times 1 is 3. I combine like terms and I get 3. 3 times 3 is 9. I combine like terms, I get negative 1. 3 times negative 1, and this pattern continues. And look at that. This one has a remainder that's 0. So the remainder is always that last number, and I should be able to write my solution here. Again, because this dropped down, x went into x to the fourth, this first number is an x cubed. So I have x cubed minus 3x squared minus 1x, or minus x, minus 1. The trick, of course, with synthetic division is that everything has to be there. So if you forget this term, because if there's a 4, there has to be a 3, a 2, a 1, and a constant. If you forget one of those, then you won't get the right answer. So that's the trick with synthetic division. Besides, it has to be a first-degree binomial. Okay, so other things that we talked about in Algebra 2 are the factor theorem. And the factor theorem says that if the expression x minus a is a factor of the polynomial, then a is a 0 of the related polynomial function. So it's a factor if it goes in evenly. Okay, so we're going to use the factor theorem to determine whether the linear expression is a factor of the polynomial. So one of the ways for us to do that is what we just did with synthetic division. So if I take this problem and I run synthetic division, okay, and again I have a degree 2, a degree 1, and a constant, and I'm going to run our synthetic division, I do not get a remainder of 0. So this one is not a factor. Now, let's be honest, we probably knew that. Factors of 12 that give me 2, yeah, it wasn't going to be 4 and 3. But we want to be able to run synthetic division to figure that out. Okay, that leads us perfectly then into the remainder theorem. So let's run number 8 with synthetic division. Again, you might want to go ahead and pause me and run your synthetic division and then check yourself and look how nice that is for number eight we do get it to, it is a it is a factor here i would say yes because we got a remainder of zero that's my little smiley face and the factors would be x squared plus 5x plus 3 and that x plus 1. So both of these are factors of that original polynomial function. Okay, that does lead us perfectly into the remainder theorem. We're going to keep those two pieces of information. The remainder theorem, if you notice, these are the exact same questions. The remainder theorem says, okay, if I evaluate the function and it's actually divided by that factor, then the remainder is that answer with that factor plugged in. So if you look back up here at number 7, we used x minus 4. Well, we divided by 4, which means I really want to find f of 4. So here's my function, the exact same function that we have, x squared plus 2x minus 12, and I want to find f of 4. So I could plug 4 in. So I'd get 4 squared plus 2 times 4 minus 12, so 16 plus 8 minus 12. So 24 minus 12 would give me 12. Well, look at that. That is the exact same number as the remainder. 
So if I wanted you to plug it in, you could have run synthetic division and just given me that number, or you could actually plug it in. So here, if I look at number eight, now we have P of X, exact same problem as number eight, and I'm choosing to put in negative one. You and I already know what's gonna happen. If I put in P of negative one, I'm gonna get out zero because we've already run synthetic division to do that. Okay, so sometimes running synthetic division is the easier way to do it. Otherwise, I have to come down here and put in that I'm gonna have a negative one. So I have negative one cubed, plus six times negative one squared, plus eight times negative one, plus three. Okay, well that's gonna be negative one minus six. Um, oh, that's a positive six, because a negative squared would be a positive, minus an eight plus a three. And if I put that together, I get five minus eight, which is three, uh, negative three plus three. And what do you know, I get zero. I get that exact same number. So we have two ways to determine if something's a factor. We could run synthetic division, check the remainder. We could plug the value in and see which one's easier. Or in, well, I would pick the one that's easier. I'll plug it in if it's pretty easy. If it's uh, much easier to run synthetic division, I will do that as well. Okay, rational zero test. We just have to review. This gives me the possibilities of my answers. So if I use number 11, and I want to know what in the world are going to be my solutions to this problem. Well, I know that there are three of them. If we were in class, I would have just had you randomly start picking them, and then I would have had you run um, the factor theorem and run synthetic division, see if you get a zero. I only want it if you get a zero if you could plug that value in and also decide if you get a zero, whichever these two ways for you to figure that out. So we would have said, oh, somebody would have guessed two and we would put two in and we'd start running two and then we try three or we tried negative one. Well, that method is just like without any kind of like direction. The remainder theorem gives us a way that we could come up with some numbers that might possibly work. So if I want possible solutions, remember, because there's only three of them, here's the list of possible solutions. We take P and divide it by Q. P is the factor of the constant term. So in this case, it's six. So all the different ways for us to get six, well, that would be one and six, negative one, and negative six. So I just start listing the factors of six in order. So I could multiply one times six, two times three, all divided by, the factors of the leading coefficient. Well, the leading coefficient is 10. So I have factors of 10. That would then work. Now, for me to give the possible rational solutions, I would have to list them. So I'm going to divide everything by 1. So if I divide everything by 1, I get the original numerator. Now I'm going to divide by 2. So I'm going to get 1 half plus and minus 1 half. 2 divided by 2, 1, it's already there. 3 divided by 2, and 6 divided by 2, already in the list. Okay, now I'm ready to divide by 5. So 1 fifth, 2 fifths, 3 fifths, and 6 fifths. Added quite a few in that list. Now we'll divide by 10, so 1 ten. 2 tenths is 1 fifth, already in the list. 3 tenths is new. And 6 tenths is 3 fifths already in the list. So if we're just going to guess numbers, those would be the numbers that we guessed. So earlier when I guessed 2 or 3, they were good choices. I wouldn't want to guess 4. 4 is not going to work. If there are rational solutions, one of those numbers would work. And the truth is, all three of them happen to be here this time. They all work. We could have one rational solution and then two irrational or to imaginary. You just never know. So I'd have to start someplace and start guessing as to what works. Well, we're not gonna guess. I'm gonna tell you that negative two works. So if I take negative two and I find my solutions, the other way for me to find my solutions, of course, would be for me to graph them on my calculator and find the zeros. Okay, so if you grab your calculator and you type in that polynomial equation. So we go ahead and type in 10x cubed 
plus 9x squared because I don't want you um, to be just guessing. Okay, we could play that game in class, but outside of class, there's no way that I'm going to guess. Okay, so here's my graph, and I'm looking for three solutions. So this point looks like it might be a point of tangency and count twice. We're about to figure that out. But I just gave you negative 2. So if I hit the trace button and I type in negative 2, I do in fact get out a 0. So negative 2 does work. The other thing that I could do is go over here and zoom in. Oops. Zoom in. And I want to get close to this other spot. So if I zoom in here, I don't know, I think I'm just going to type in trace, put it at zero, and I'm going to zoom in there. Okay, well, I'm clearly not at zero. Let me go back to my original graph. I went zoom standard. I want to zoom in right at this point. So let me hit trace, get my cursor over there. There it is. So I'm going to zoom in at that spot. And you'll notice that it very well might be a double root, or it looks like it might go below and come back up. I'm going to zoom in one more time. I'm going to hit trace and get close to this spot, and I'm going to hit zoom in yet again. And if I hit enter, It actually looks like it now for sure goes below it and comes back up. So that's two very different answers. Okay, very two different solutions that I'm going to come up with. Okay, but they have to be in this list. So I'm going to run synthetic division with that negative 2 that we just found. And we should get a remainder of 0. 2 times 10 is negative 20. Nine times 20 is 11, sorry. That's 22. I was like, this isn't working out so well. That's a difference of three. And look at that, I got a remainder of zero. We knew that between looking at the graph and me telling you that that number was gonna work. Well, now I'm left with 10x squared minus 11x plus three. Well, I can try synthetic division, but at this point, I could also go ahead and see if I could factor it. So if I try to factor this, and I say 10 times 3 is 30, factors of 30 that give me 11, oh, well, that's 5 and 6. So I just have to make a 5 and a 6. So 5 times 2, there's my 6. I need my both of them to be negative. If I set them equal to 0, I'm going to get 3 fifths and positive 1 half. And those are my three solutions. So my solutions would be negative 2, 1 half, and 3 fifths. Notice that 3 fifths is in this list, and so is positive 1 half, as well as the negative 2. If it's going to have a rational solution, it's going to be in that list. Okay, you can read the conjugate root theorem, and then pause me, and then you can pick back up when you're ready. So according to the conjugate root theorem, it says that if the square root of 2 is a root, then the negative square root of 2 is also a root. They're going to run in conjugate pairs. And if 1 plus i is an answer, then 1 minus i is also going to be an answer. So it's asking me, what are the other two roots? Well, there they are. Negative square root of 2 and 1 minus i. Now I want to write the quartic equation that would make that happen. Okay, I don't want to write this and write these as factors. I could write x minus square roots of 2, x plus the square roots of 2. That's all fine until I get to here. And then what is this? Uh, I'm not really sure. So when I handle irrational or imaginary answers and I want to write their factors, we handle that a completely different way. If I want to write those factors, I simply say, well, x is going to equal plus and minus the square root of 2. I know that there have to be two solutions here, so this part has to be a quadratic. We know we're going to get a quartic with four solutions, but we've got to build up to that. So if we square both sides, 
we get x squared is equal to, well, if I square a positive or I square a negative, it's positive. And the square roots of 2 squared is simply 2. So if I move everything to one side, there's my factors that would give me plus and minus the square root of 2. So if I'm going to write this polynomial function, I'm going to say that, well, there's one of my factors because I'm looking for integral factored form. I want these to be integers. I don't want imaginaries. I don't want irrational. Okay, we're going to do the same thing, of course, with this 1 plus and minus i. I'm going to say that these two factors are set equal to 0. Those two factors have to give me a quadratic equation. So, again, I'm going to subtract 1 so that I'm just left with the imaginary, just like here I was left with the irrational. And I'm going to square both sides. So when I square this side, I'm going to get a fun-filled quadratic. And positive squared is positive. Negative squared is positive. Looks like I'm just going to get an i squared that you and I both know is negative 1. I'm going to add 1 to the other side. And there's my quadratic equation that would produce plus and minus 1 plus and minus i as my solutions. So I'm going to take that factor my x squared minus 2x plus 2, and I've just written a polynomial, a quartic equation for the polynomial function. This could be my solution if I'm allowed to leave it in factored form. And you remember in Algebra 2 last year, we left it in factored form quite often because that was more useful than anything else. The other thing that you could do is sit here and actually just multiply it out. So if I take x squared times x squared, I'm going to get x to the fourth. There's my quartic equation. x squared times the next one, negative 2x cubed, plus 2x squared as I keep doing this. Um, it's funny that my Algebra 2 class used to call this the rainbow way to multiply things together because you end up making this little like rainbow thing here that happens. And it looks like my polynomial, my p of x, is going to be x to the fourth minus 2x cubed plus a 4x squared. Uh, sorry, those x squareds canceled out. One's positive, one's negative. So we're going to have just a positive 4x minus 4. So it depends upon the directions, but you could leave your answer in either one of these, in factored form or in standard form. Standard form just simply means you multiplied it all out. Okay, if there are no directions, I'm going to leave it in factored form. Okay, number 15. Oh, fundamental theorem of algebra. I just spoke of that earlier. If it's degree 4, there's 4 solutions. Degree 3, there's 3 solutions. By all means, you can read the, fun, the, the theorem. Okay, what are the roots of this polynomial equation? Well, I would go to my calculator if I can't do this any other way. Um, it looks like... This is a degree 5, so I'm looking for 5 solutions. We cannot stop until we find all of the solutions, whether they're real or imaginary. Now, this particular problem looks like it's probably going to factor. I don't have any other choices with a degree 5. With a degree 2, I have all kinds of choices. But degree 5, I do not. So I think I'm going to factor by grouping. Let's see, out of the next two, I can take a negative 3x squared. Out of the next two, I can pick out a negative 4, and they match. It does, in fact, factor. So one of my factors is x minus 1, and then my other factor is what we pulled out. So out of the five solutions, we found one of them. One of my answers is literally going to be 1. Okay, now I'm going to take what's left, and I think this is going to factor again. As a matter of fact, I feel like we did this problem earlier because I want x to the 4, so I need x squared and x squared. I need to add and get 4. I'm not sure. I think earlier they may have been um, different factors. Maybe not. Feels really familiar. And it looks out of here I'm going to get a positive 2 and a negative 2. So a negative 2 for the first one, a positive 2 for the second. And then this one I do think we did earlier. I'm going to set that equal to 0. I'm going to take the square root. I have to remember that I'm looking for two solutions. And I'm going to get plus and minus i. So those are my five solutions to that polynomial equation. 
Now the cool part about even if I let you use your calculator, your calculator would allow you to get the real ones. And then you would have to run synthetic division to get the imaginary. So you're doing work either way. So as you go through the homework, if you can do it without your calculator, do. Factor it, do your thing. If you need your calculator, like we did back here, to find one of the solutions, then run one of the solutions, get your synthetic division and or long division, and find the other solutions. Okay? Our next topic is end behavior. So if we have a polynomial function, and it's an even degree, so we're talking you know, x squared, x to the fourth, etc. If it's an even degree, then we know that this thing is either going to go up together or down together. So if it's a negative x to the fourth, then they're going down together. So if it's an even degree, if the leading coefficient is positive, okay, they're both going to go up. If the leading coefficient is negative, then they're both going to go down. So that means as x approaches positive infinity, as we're walking here along the x-axis, the y values are going up. As we walk along the x-axis, uh, what's happening to our y values, they're also going up. Even functions are going to go together, okay? Like two uh, women shopping at the mall. Then, if they're negative, they're going to go down together. So as I walk towards positive infinity, these two things are going to go down. As I walk towards negative infinity, my y values are definitely going down. Now, if we have an odd degree polynomial function, so now we're talking like x cubed, we remembered that what that looks like, or an x to the fifth, or an x to the seventh, technically even x to the first. If I graph x to the first on the same coordinate grid, it's just a line, it just doesn't have curvature, but it does the exact same things. So if it's odd and the leading coefficient is positive, then the right must go up. You'll notice that if the leading coefficient here is positive, oops, let me change colors, that's dictating what's happening on the right. And if the leading coefficient's negative, that's also dictating what's happening on the right. Then they're going down. Okay, so if this is an odd, the odd go off in opposite directions. So my graph would do something like this. There would be a nice cubic function. So as x approaches positive infinity, the y values go up. And you don't have to write the plus, I like to. As we go towards negative infinity, my y values are going down. So if it's an odd function, if the right is going down, the left has to go up. That would be, if you had me last year, gentlemen shopping at the mall. Not to be stereotypical, but you know, you tend to go off in opposite directions. So as x approaches positive infinity, now my y's are going down. As x approaches negative infinity, my y values are going up. So again, we can link that if the leading coefficient is negative, the right is going down, and the right again is going down. The other side, the left, is then doing the opposite of what it does. Okay, important things about polynomial equations. Um, the polynomial equations can only have the degree minus one, the number of terms. So if we look at number one, and this is degree three, it can have at most two terms. Degree five can have at most four terms. The function of degree n has at most n x-intercepts. Well, if it has a degree of five, it's going to have five x-intercepts, okay, as long as they're real. I mean, imaginary numbers sort of throw a loop in that. The x-intercepts are the zeros of the function. At an x-intercept, well, if we have an x-intercept, that means that we have a number, an x, comma, a zero. So that means that the value of the function, so if I put in x, I'm going to get out zero. Well, that's exactly what's happening when we did long division and our remainder was zero. Or if we put that function in, like we did on the last page, we put in negative one, we got out a zero. Well, that's telling me that it's an x-intercept. So I could go back to the page that we did before and here not only say that they go, that oops, two pages before, but here not only is this a factor, but that in this case, negative one comma zero is an x-intercept of this graph. Because when I put something in, I got out a zero, 
that's telling me that there is an x-intercept at that particular spot. Okay, the y-intercept, of course, is when we have the y-value, so the x-value is a zero, and this is the same as the constant term. So if I go back up to this chart, then I want to find the y-intercept, oops, back here to number one, the y-intercept here is that constant. This would have a y-intercept at zero comma negative one, because if I put zero in here, zero in here, it's gone. Same thing for example two. If this is zero and this is zero, my y-intercept would be at four. Please make sure that you write your x and y-intercepts as coordinate pairs, not just numbers. Okay, multiplicity from last year. We have three different types of multiplicity. Um, we have a point of intersection. a point of tangency, and of course a point of inflection. Okay, the point of intersection is the easiest ones. So if I have an xy grid and I want to graph it and it just intersects, well that's going to count as a unique root. This is a unique or only one solution. Okay, this is a unique or one root or one solution. If I have a point of tangency on my xy grid, okay, that point of tangency, we've called that in the past, it's been a bounce. So it comes down and touches that x-axis and then bounces back up. This is often called a double root. Technically, it could count as a multiplicity of any even number. So this might be a double root, it might be a quartic root, it could count as four solutions, two solutions, six solutions, any even number. Now a point of inflection, when I go to put that on a xy coordinate grid, this is the one that we often call a wiggle, where the concavity changes. So here it's concave down like a frown, and here it's concave up like a cup. Where that concavity changes on the x-axis or anywhere is denoted as a point of inflection. This, we're used to seeing it in our x equals x, or y equals x cubed function, it counts as three solutions. Okay, so we could call it a triple root, or better yet, we could just simply say it's a multiplicity of any odd number. Okay, so we have a unique which I don't really think we can call that multiplicity because multiplicity means there's more than one. So it has one root, one solution. If we see that point of tangency, more than one. Definitely an even number. It could be two, it could be four, it could be six, it could be eight. And if we see this sort of wiggle that happens where the concavity changes, then that's going to be a multiplicity of an odd number. Like that could count as three as it did here, or five, or seven, or nine, etc. Okay, again, you're going to want to pause me, read through how we graph polynomial functions and all about turning points. And when you're ready, you can hit play again, and we'll start um, with number seven. Okay, so we're going to graph our first polynomial function here, and there's definitely some things that we can do without a calculator and things that they will then need our calculator for. So my maximum number of terms, of course, is the highest power, minus 1, so that's a 3. I know that this is a degree 4 polynomial, and the leading coefficient is positive. So if the leading coefficient is positive, the right's going to go up, and the left is going to go up. Because it's even, it goes together. So as x's get bigger and bigger and bigger, what's going to happen to those y's? Those y values are going to go up. As things get smaller and smaller, as I'm going towards negative infinity, What's going to happen to my y values? Well, they're going to get bigger and bigger. Then I want to find the x-intercept, the factored form, and the y-intercept. Okay, y-intercept, about the easiest thing that's there, because remember, it's the constant. If we go back and put 0 in everywhere else, we would get that constant regardless. Okay, so my graph isn't quite big enough to handle that constant of negative 12, so I'm just going to go down here and mark negative 12 and put a dot on it. Now, local max, local mins, increasing and decreasing, all of these things are going to be calculator issues. So let's keep doing as much as we can before we need our calculator. 
Then our domain arrange. Well, the domain is going to be quite interesting because it's going to go, if I look at my arrows, it's going to go all the way to the left and all the way to the right. One of the qualities of a polynomial function is that it doesn't have a domain restriction. So that's a silly question for me to keep asking because the domain is going to be negative infinity to positive infinity. Now, for my range, this thing is going to both go up. It's going to come down here and touch at least negative 12. Will that be the lowest spot? I don't know. Looks like we need a little bit more help to get us to that point. So could we go back here and group this and factor it? I don't think so. So it's time to go to our calculators, type that in, and let's take a look at it. So grab your calculator, type in our polynomial function. The only other thing that we could do would be to um, run the rational zero test, and then we could guess. But again, I'm really not into the guessing at this level. So since we did use our calculator to do some weird things, I'm going to go back to Zoom Standard so that I can get that normal graph on my paper, on my negative 10 to positive 10. Okay, we're looking for four solutions because this is a degree four, but it looks like it only crosses the x-axis twice. Looks like it's going to cross here at negative one. So I'm going to hit trace and just type in negative one. Oh yeah, that is a solution. It also looks like it's going to hit here at 3. So now that I'm in trace mode, yep, it does hit at 3. So I'm going to take those two solutions back and see what we can do with them. So I know if I'm going to get the factored form, I already have two of my solutions. So I'm going to say P of X, because that's how it was given to me here. We notice that it touched at negative 1. So if my X intercept is negative 1, then my factored form is going to be X plus 1. The other x-intercept that we noticed was 3 comma 0, which means that I'm going to have a factored form of x minus 3. Those were the only two x-intercepts, yet this factored form is not finished because this should result in a degree for a polynomial. So I'm going to take that polynomial and we could run synthetic or long division. I think I'm going to choose synthetic because it's quick, it's fast, and it's amazing. And I'm going to choose either one of these to start off with, either the negative 1 or the 3. I wrote the negative 1 first. It's the only reason I'm right, running the negative 1 first. So 4, 3, 2, 1, constant. Everything's there. And we're just running our synthetic division to make sure that we get a remainder of 0. Okay, I could take what's left and try to factor it. So that's x cubed minus 3x squared plus 4x minus 12. That looks pretty good to factor, to be honest. So if I can factor that, I think I'm going to do factor by grouping. Out of the first two, I can pull out an x squared. Out of the second two, I can pull out a 4. And what do you know? Those match, and I get this negative x minus 3. This negative 3, that doesn't surprise me at all because there's the factor that I wrote down earlier. And I already knew that x-intercept. This is the part that I didn't know, was that x squared plus 4. So in factored form, that would go in as x squared plus 4. Now my factored form is complete. How do I know that I can write that in my factored form? Because this doesn't factor. I can't write this any other way. I can solve it if you'd like. If I set this equal to 0 and I subtract x, I could take the square root, pull out the negative 1, and the square root of 4 is 2. So the other two solutions are plus and minus 2i. Well, I also can't write those as x-intercepts because they're not real. I can only write real values as an x-intercept. Okay, so now let's find increasing, decreasing domain, and oh, we already found the domain range. And you'll notice looking at your graph, you're already at that value. So if you want to find, and you should remember this from Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, how to find the, mins, or the minimums and maximums, 
looks like we're going to have a minimum way down here, so I'm going to need to make my window go much further down. I need to change my Y values to go much further down. Just going to kind of guess here and say 30. So this gives me a decent picture as to what's going on. Oh, and 30 was a pretty good window. I want to find that minimum value. So I'm going to go second trace. I'm going to choose minimum. I'm going to mark it on the left side. I'm going to get past the minimum value and mark it on the right side. And that's going to be my relative minimum. Okay, so I'm going to go back and write that down as my minimum. And that was 1.826, rounding to three decimal places, negative 24.333. So it does go lower than that negative 12. Okay, let's graph as much of this as we can. Let's see, it touches here at negative 1, it touches at positive 3, and it goes down here below negative 12 down to negative 24. So, again, it still has to go off, and the arrows in both directions, so off in that quadrant. Okay, I have to cross at negative 12, go down to negative 24, and I need to come back and go off in that direction. So that's not a bad graph, even though we've had to use our calculator to get there. In this case, there isn't a maximum. Now, if I want to say where it's increasing, well, as I read this graph from left to right here, it's definitely decreasing. So I'm going to say that it's decreasing from negative infinity up to this x value. And that x value is on my minimum, 1.826. And then, as soon as I hit that low spot, this side's going to increase. So I'm going to say that that happens from 1.826 to positive infinity. Now I've covered all of that domain. Negative infinity to positive infinity is included. Last but not least, the range. So if I want to know how low this goes, how low down can it go, well, that goes down to negative 24.333 up to positive infinity. Well, the question comes, does it touch down here at negative 24.3 repeating? It does. So this bracket should be square, not rounded, because I know that it touches at that point. So if you can factor them, you're going to factor. If you need to use your calculator to get you started to run your synthetic division, that would be fantastic, because I do not want to run rational zero test and guess. Okay, last but not least, here's the end of the polynomial. Can you solve polynomial inequalities? So if I take this polynomial inequality and I get everything on one side, oops, I think I'm going to add 3x squared, so that's going to give me a positive 2x squared plus an x. Now, if these things are greater than 0, I'm looking for the positives. I actually don't want the zeros. I just want where, I just want where things are positive. So if I factor out an x, and I factor the remaining, you're going to find that I have a double root. I have one's going to happen twice. Well, we used to make a fancy little chart back in Algebra 2, and by the end of this unit, we got down to, well, if we could graph it or get a decent picture of what it looks like, then we could figure out this polynomial. So I know that it's going to cross here at negative 1. I know that that's going to be a negative uh, double root, and I know that it's going to cross here at 0. So if I know that this thing is a cubic function, the right has to go up, the right, ha the right has to go up, the left has to go down, and at negative 1, I have a double root, so I need that point of tangency, and then I'm finally going to go up. There's my graph. Well, if I have that graph, I can state my solutions. I want to know where this thing is positive. Okay, and if this thing is positive, then I'm looking for where it's above the x-axis. So if I'm looking for the positives, I'm looking for this little piece right here. So it looks like it's positive, from 0 to positive infinity. There is my first, or my only solution. I want to know where that thing has positive values. Okay, one more to do. Let's do the same thing. Um, I personally like my leading coefficient to be positive, so I'm going to add everything to, I'm going to at least add that to the other side. I'm going to subtract 6x squared, and I'm going to subtract 7x. 
and that would leave me with a zero over here. Before I get too far into this problem, because it's less than zero, I'm looking for the negatives and the zeros. Okay, the zeros are when I touch the x-axis, and of course the negatives are below. So now we're ready to factor it, so I'm going to factor out an x. And that factors again, factors of 7, that give me 6. And I'm ready to graph it. So if I'm going to go and graph this on the coordinate system, I'm going to touch at 0, I'm going to touch at 7, and I'm going to touch at negative 1. And it's a cubic function again, so it's going to go off in opposite directions. So the right, the leading coefficient is positive, so the right's going to go up, and the left is going to go down. So I have to hit here at negative 1, 0, and 7. And you'll know there's no multiplicities on there. There's no squares or cubes or anything else that would be occurring. They all are just unique solutions, so they touch. Okay, I want to know where it's negative or it's 0. So it looks like to me it's negative, it's below the x-axis here, and 0. So I'm going to say that's from negative infinity up to negative 1. That negative 1 is included because it does touch it. Okay, then it's positive, and then it starts being negative again. So I want it when it's below the x-axis. I want these values. And I can include the zeros. So I'm going to say that it also happens from 0 to 7. And that's the end of polynomial review. You can do the homework on polynomials now.